Welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Dave Rosenstein. I'm a member of Community Board 8 in Manhattan. Our guests tonight are the co-chairs of CB8 Zoning and Development Committee, Terry Slater and Dr. Lane Walsh. Terry, a longtime member of CB8, is also co-chair of Defenders of the Historic Upper East Side, a group that has been active in zoning issues. Dr. Walsh is associate professor in Hunter College's Department of Urban Affairs and Planning. She has a PhD in social work and teaches in the areas of nonprofit management and social policy. Elaine is also president of the East 86th Street Association. And in her spare time, she's the principal investigator for the Gallagher Initiative, a study of the older Irish in Queens. Now, let's talk about zoning. It affects all of us, but it's bewildering to most. Just take a look at the zoning map of this community board, 59th Street to 96th Street in the Upper East Side. This map came to us, by the way, from the City Planning Commission, which also publishes a terrific and remarkably understandable zoning handbook, which sells for about $24. That's this, uh, this publication, which if you uh, go to the New York City website, uh, WNYC, W, uh, nyc.gov and just type in the search uh, zoning handbook you'll you'll find it one definition of zoning taken from civitas that's an upper east side organization that's been very active in land use issues but they're out of print but wonderful little book the abcs of zoning one definition is to divide a city into sections reserved for different purposes as residences business and manufacturing and to add within zones the size shape or other features of buildings. Our board zoning and development committee reviews zoning issues that impact the community, violations of construction issues, like an extra floor that isn't permitted, illegal signage and banners, and also proposals to strengthen the zoning. Before we start, a brief note about Manhattan Community Board 8. It is one of 12 community boards in Manhattan. It covers the Upper East Side from 59th Street to 96th Street from 5th Avenue to the East River and also includes Roosevelt Island. It's one of the most populated community boards in the city. You know, New York has 59 community boards. Um, community boards play an advisory role in zoning and other land use issues in community planning in the city budget process and in the coordination of municipal services. So, zoning. Uh, Terry, let's start with the zoning resolution. What is it? Well, the zoning resolution guides the development uh, in the city, and it includes regulations uh, dealing with use, bulk, uh, parking requirements. There are zoning districts, zoning boundaries, and you just showed the map. They're shown on the zoning maps, and uh, the identified permitted, they identif the zoning maps identify permitted uses in any given area, uh, dealing with height and setback regulations, density, um, parking requirements, bulk regulations. It's not as complicated as it seems once you get the hang of it. Um, zoning is really, in any city, not just New York, is the blueprint for any city. It's not written in stone. It can change. But in my humble opinion, it should reflect and protect the character of any city. And I think New York's zoning resolution does that. So that's what it is. You can look up your neighborhood and find out how high buildings will be, how bulky, and uh, it's very, very informative. And, and I think more people should know about zoning, understand it, because we'd have a lot less confusion in our neighborhoods. This handbook is really excellent. Um, I'm sorry we don't have graphics of some of the drawings, but uh, for example, simple diagrams of types of zoning, so types of construction. It's really well worthwhile for anybody who's active in, in civic affairs and, and uh, obviously all the developers and, and, and the attorneys who work in the field know this, uh, know this very well. Um, ULERP is an acronym, Uniform Land Use Review Procedure. How does ULERP relate to, to zoning? Well, um, you know, it, it's mandated by the city charter, and it's the public's opportunity to review uh, applications dealing with land use that come down the pike. And it actually goes back to Mayor Wagner, the whole idea of 
uh, the boards. He was the first person to suggest community boards and uh, having a planning role. So uh, the um, ULERP applications we get to review, and it's the public's chance to look at them when they come to community boards. It's a, it's a long process, it, it, too long for some, not long enough for others, uh, that involves a community board review for 60 days, then the um, borough president's review for 30 days, then the um, city planning commission's review for another 60 days, I think, I hope I got that right, and then city council review for some, some kinds of applications. If there are uh, changes to zoning districts or the boundaries are being changed, revocable consents, uh, special permits that are ultimately need um, city planning uh, uh, approval. Um, uh, it's a, it's a process that I find very useful and necessary. Uh, there is discussion about, you know, changing it in some way, and I, uh, maybe it could be more efficient. I don't know, but that's what it is. Elaine, we talked about um, community facilities on the Upper East Side. Uh, I was told that our district, Community Board 8, has a higher permitted density or floor area ratio uh, for so-called community facilities in the mid-blocks than any other district in the city. Uh, is this true? And is this something that your committee seeks to address? Uh, yes, it is true. And it, it, it happened when our district was in a period of high development. And in order for certain institutions to finish their work, and they had come in under the higher FAR. Um, FAR is floor area, floor area ratio. ratio. And what it permits uh, for them was to finish. And at that point, uh, when the zoning was being changed, one of the issues that was not looked at, you know, with hindsight, one would do it differently. But we are left with a community facility, FAR 5.1. The rest of the city is 4.5. In the mid-blocks. In the mid-blocks, OK, for the R8 zoning. And what it permits is for community facilities to have more space, OK? We are trying to bring us, and we've been asked by city planning, to really re-examine the regulations for us for R8B and have a application submitted to city planning to bring us into conformity with the rest of the city and we're in that process now. It's R8B is the zoning in the mid blocks? Yes, in the mid blocks. R for residential and 8 is a category of that. Right. And what we're, we're trying to do is look at that community facilities should have no greater opportunity to build more than the residents that live there. Well, if I could add, particularly in the mid-block. In the mid -block. Because this, this began with the uh, RAP mid-block zoning, and the whole intent of the RAP mid-block zoning was to preserve the low-scale brownstone character of the mid-blocks. Mm -hmm. When I was talking about a city's character in Manhattan, those kinds of neighborhoods, and other boroughs as well, you have higher a uh, buildings on the avenues and the lower buildings in the mid-blocks. You know, it's a different feeling. And both have a synergistic relationship. The tall buildings benefit from the lower buildings and vice versa. But anyway, um, uh, that R8B uh, uh, has to be preserved because um, there, there would have been no point in fighting so hard. Our board supported it unanimously many years ago in the 80s. And uh, they, Community Board 8 is the applicant in this case. We are the applicant for this zoning text amendment that uh, wants to return uh, the community facility benefit of 5.1 FAR back to 4.0 where it was at one time. And being the only community board in the entire city having this, it's kind of anomalous, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we inherited this, Elaine and I, That's right. um, in, in the Zoning and Development Committee. And we just like to see it through. We've submitted our application to city planning. They've asked us some questions, which we just uh, received answers for. We have a professional working on it. They were a little technical. 
and um, the process that I described before will begin. The, the, once they review it, city planning, it'll come back to us for the 60-day period to review. We hold a public hearing, and um, we have 60 days to write a recommendation. And then, then it begins the journey to the borough president's office, and then back to city planning, and ultimately, well, this will, I don't think this will go to the city council, because it's not a full ULERP, yes. it's a modified ULERP application, because it's a zoning text amendment. So um, that's why we're... Are the hospitals uh, along York Avenue fighting this aggressively, or are they willing to make some <laughs> peace with the community? Um, I think when they fully understand it, I think I don't think anybody is truly fighting, fighting it. They may be resisting the change. We certainly hope they understand that we're the only community board, and it would be peculiar. And it's... Without getting very technical, it's very difficult to use mm -hmm. that 1.1 extra FAR. It's just very difficult to use. We've talked to many architects, city planners, engineers, and they all say the same thing. It depends. If you had a vacant lot, it would be a different situation. But with the extant buildings, any given building that a community facility may purchase, a hospital, a school, whatever, it's very difficult to use that 1.1 mm -hmm. FAR. So um, we have historic districts, there's, commu mm -hmm. there's Landmarks Commission overview, you know, there are all kinds of situations that prevent that full use. Mm -hmm. Elaine, I want to ask you about something that has, <clears throat> to me, it doesn't make any sense at all. When I was a kid, I used to come over from the west side to go to the RKO 86th Street movie theater on Lexington Avenue and 86th Street. I did as a child too because I lived down the block. The movie theater was uh, replaced when Gimbel's was built on that site. The movie theater, I guess, was grandfathered, so they came back into the new building. But the RKO is gone. It's a Duane Reed, but there's a big marquee outside left over from the RKO. It doesn't belong there. Uh, how does this fit into the, the zoning category? Well, There's I'm an image on the screen of the, uh, uh, the movie marquee. Looks familiar. And what's playing? Dwayne Reed. It's been playing right. the same movie it's weeks, it, months. It, it, it must sell out. I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, signage is part of the zoning regulations. And in this particular situation, and let me just say that there are many signage violations in our community and across the city. But in this particular situation, there, there is no permit for that sign. It is illegal, and the sign and the marquee should come down. And our committee, along with many others in the community, have been working on this issue for a number of years. We have now been told that there is a process in place that the commissioner for the Department for Transportation will be moving. Buildings. buildings I'm sorry. You can tell I have another world of transportation <laughs> issues. Um, will be moving to have that signage removed. We're waiting for the day that it happens. But we have worked aggressively on this. We have not just done Dwayne Reed, but other signage in the 86th Street co corridor, as well as as we branch out to all the avenues. All the banners you used to see on the buildings, they used to be painted on for ads. Now there are like banners that are put up on these walls. We've worked to have those removed. They're illegal in our community. We've been successful there. We've identified a host of different um, violations of signage. But Dwayne Reed, we know, we get numerous complaints about. And we want to assure the community we are trying our hardest, but we need the Department of Buildings to step forward and do the enforcement on this. And right around the corner, if we go to Lexington Avenue, there's Staples that's in violation. Uh, on their state signage, we could give you a list in the community of where the violations are. I think we, we may have a graphic of the uh, the Staples banners. Uh, yeah, that's up on the. Um, mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Well, actually, that's. It, it's Best Buy on the left a little. Well, that's Buy, also the illegal. Staples is around the corner. There, but there it is. There it is. Okay, those 
that whole row. Is illegal, uh, and now we have Petco there, I see, doing. Another. Right. So what we really see is uh, a lot of environmental pollution there, or I call it signage pollution. Because, you know, you, when you want to walk, New York City is all about streets and walking. And when you want to walk down and feel peace and enjoy the open space, what other community really walks in this country? Other cities, yes, but not like New Yorkers. Especially mm -hmm. in residential areas. Yeah. You know, this is a primarily residential area, Community Board 8, and uh, the local retail uses, the C1, C2 local retail uses, are supposed to be um, small stores. Small stores. And they're, they're supposed to be low-impact signage. It's, it's spelled out in the zoning resolution, and yet there are so many sign violations, and it, it, it's taken on the feel on some blocks of an intensely commercial experience you would find in Midtown instead of a, a local retail area. And that's um, something we hope will change. We're working to mm -hmm. change it, at least. Um, a lot of people express uh, views about garish signage and bright lights, um, flashing lights in some cases. We've been able to get those taken down, but uh, it's, um, it's a tough fight because the city is strapped. There was an issue, uh, not an issue, there was a serious concern about safety some time ago last year, the last couple of years with cranes and all kinds of things falling and uh, so signage sort of was pushed by the wayside and it's it, people are now the Department of Buildings is more uh, able to focus on on signage violations and, and the other thing is you know people walk down and they're amazed about what they see but they don't think there's anything they can do but there is something they can do they can call in the violations to 311 or to the community board. And the more data we have, the more we then can discuss with the Department of Buildings the need for them to come up to our community and enforce the regulations. So we do need the community input because it can't be just a couple of people in the community or Terry and I seen as, you know, the, the signage <laughs> mavens. Uh, I mean, I must be honest with you. I talk to people about signage. They think I'm a little crazy, and they go, what's the issue? I don't notice it. Once they start to look, then they call and say, well, why is that? And I said, because we as a community need to be more proactive in identifying the violations and calling them in. We don't expect the Department of Buildings to walk our streets every day, but we do we expect once the complaints are in, that there's a follow-through to us. So we really do need the community to be with us. Part of the problem is that the community, most residents don't know what the rules right. are. And I was going to ask you this at the end, but maybe this is a good time. Um, I'm wondering if there's a role for your committee in helping to educate both the board members who need refreshers and interested members of the community, perhaps with, with an annual forum on land use mm -hmm. and zoning mm -hmm. issues. I think it's a great idea. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I know the East 86th Street Association, along with um, Carnegie Hill Neighbors, put out a brochure on signage. And it shows you how to look. It gives you the rules and regulations. And then how to look at, in your area, what's legal and what's not legal. And maybe we should ask them if it would be OK. Uh, and and do a forum with I some others, great. I mean, we've including had some city agencies. We've had housing forums. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and educational. That would we be. We empower people with the information; they'll be more likely to. Uh, Absolutely, David. That's a wonderful idea. You, you mentioned canopies in in, in uh, the visual pollution. The uh, PC Richards on 86th Street was one. HSBC. There's lots of commercial canopies. PC Delight. Um, they're not legal, apparently. Or there's some question about their legality? I think they, in some cases, are legal. And it's unfortunate. Uh, they're illegal where they um, are installed over subway grates or around parking meters, any kind of uh, situation like that. But um, the Department of Transportation uh, uh, controls the installation of canopies, not the Department of Buildings. And we have successfully, uh, we've 
had them removed in our area. Um, There's one fellow who, a uh, chain store, had his canopy over a parking meter, and the poles for the canopy actually went like this, mm. to, instead of straight to incorporate the parking meters down. Another person had it over a, su a, a subway grate. Uh, they're unfortunate because when one merchant installs a canopy, as PC Richard has, other merchants begin to wonder if they should install them. And you have this row of canopies that sort of cancel one another out. And the benefit the first person had you know, is diminished by the other canopies. They did, people but can't see them except the ones on the end. One of you but mentioned 72nd Street on the west side had done some kind of a yes, cooperative. Yes, uh, that was a mm -hmm. wonderful effort. It's a, it was a busy street like 86th Street. And a preservation group on the west side, Landmark West, um, focused on West 72nd Street because it had many, many canopies and garish signage. And they focused and worked with the merchants cooperatively, trying to find a better look for um, 77th Street. All the canopies came down. They have nicer signage. It's a different street. They have muni meters. Um, it can be done. Mm -hmm. Let me just say that the other uh, piece of the zoning says that a canopy can't be with in, and I'm not, I can't remember, it's four feet or five feet of a tree pit. And so when we go down 86th Street and we look at the canopies we identified, there are tree pits there. Mm -hmm. So they are in violation of the space. They're too close. And, and some of them were in violation because they were right next to the um, parking meters. But of course, as we remove the parking meters, and put the muni meters, which is only one stand, then it opens up more space for them to put their canopies if it's not near a tree. And I would hope that the trees would, particularly with the mayor's million trees program, that the trees would outweigh the canopies. It's interesting, there are standards in parts of the city that um, uh, I, I do admire and would like to emulate where you have bids. I'm not necessarily a fan of all bids, you know, everywhere. Business improvement district. But a business improvement district. And you will see how the signage improves when you enter a business improvement district. There are no canopies. There are all kinds of wonderful additions like planters and hanging baskets and extra garbage cans. The whole, it has a different feel. And it is a cooperative effort between the people who run it and the merchants uh, who uh, you know, have their stores there. Uh, I think it, it, it's something we're trying to do on 86th Street. Um, uh, we'd, we're not a bid, but we'd like to have standards like that for signage and, and wonderful, it's, it's a beautification effort to make the street a more vibrant commercial thoroughfare. And I think where bids exist, you have that. And they tend to reflect the areas they're in. You know, it's not all plastic look of one kind of sign. Uh, you know, there's variety, um, but they do, are very strict about the kind of signage and in some cases the kinds of stores. Well, um, so. But the, the problem is, if there's a bid, the landowners are being taxed. The landowners are being taxed. So it's a double tax. We already are paying for certain services in this city. And there's no reason why the city agencies are not fulfilling their obligations to each of the committee, communities. Community Board 8 is in a very wealthy community. Yet the services that we should be receiving are not there. And you have to ask why. Is it that our community is not active enough and they're not demanding enough? But we already are paying for the services. The bids, for the most part, when they were set up, they were for security reasons. They were safety issues. And the city was a mess. And this was an added tax to clean up certain areas. But we're more a residential community. And a bid doesn't really fit with residential because of the way the taxes are, et cetera. Well, so we really need to look at how we can, as a community, work with the city agencies to fulfill the obligations that they have. You know, there, there are certain things that they do in the neighborhood, like parking issues that they have no trouble enforcing on residents, but there's other parking issues that they don't enforce. 
but where is the are the other services that would help us all have a healthier life? Well, I think bids do have a place, uh, sadly, because of the population pressures and in areas where there are transportation hubs like 86th Street, I'm not advocating for one necessarily on 86th Street, but maybe a baby bid or a quasi bid or an informal bid because the, the pressure on transportation hubs is enormous in terms of pedestrian mm -hmm. traffic, vehicular traffic, and um, that's one way of dealing with the problems. We're just about out of time, but I, I want to ask you both. Community Board 8 has a Zoning and Development Committee, mm -hmm. as a Land Use Committee, and the issues are divided up between them. Generally speaking, is there adequate time for the Community Board and residents to review issues that involve zoning changes or amendments? Well, you'd have to ask the members of the community, and the feedback we've gotten in the past has been that things um, happen very quickly, and there isn't enough time for the community to respond. People don't know about meetings in a timely fashion. Um, I believe in democracy, you know, uh, having people be able to express their views, be able to review something, not unlike the way the um, uh, Euler process works. So, you know, everything doesn't go through Euler. As of right, buildings don't go through Euler. But the public does have a right to to know about projects and be able to uh, respond. And we've had many projects come through our community board, and it I think it's in our bylaws. I don't uh, honestly know the history of that uh, land use land. You, you know, uh, and our zoning and development committee mm -hmm. separation between the two. Well, let me, let me just say that when <coughs> there are developments that do come to the community uh, board, you know what? We're just out of time, so I just want to say thank you for listening. Our guests have been Terry Slater, Elaine Walsh, co-chairs of the Development and uh, Zoning Committee with Community Board 8. Thank you for listening. Thank you for having thank us. You.